Hello, good evening, and very welcome to the event. And to you, we have Beer Jerusalem, Billy Bragg on William Blake. Billy Bragg, the singer, songwriter, and activist, will share with us tonight his views on England, nationalism, and the influence of Billy Blake on his work. Blake has long been an inspiration for Bragg who recorded Jerusalem by Perry in 1990 and the album William Bloke in 2006. And this event is an opportunity to hear more about how the 19th century poet, painter and musician has shaped his views and music. As war breaks out in Europe once more, Blake is definitely a figure who can bring us together in the spirit of Billy Bragg's most recent album, The Million Things That Never Happened, released last year, and which Billy will play in his touring start in May. Tonight, Billy will be in conversation with Jason Whitaker, professor of the University of Lincoln, who has published an incredible number of books on Blake and is author of the upcoming book, Jerusalem, Blake, Perry, and the Fight for Englishness, in which he explores the way in which William Blake's vision of the country arises from hope rather than despair, opening possibilities for a radical transformation of a country once dominated by the dark satanic muse of the Industrial Revolution. Today, we have new satanic devices and enemies to subdue, but his hymn still resonates and provokes us all in different ways. I'll say no more because our guests have a great deal to share with us tonight. Welcome, Billy and Jason. The floor is yours. Thank you, Camilla. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. And also, it gives me immense pleasure to be um, able to speak to Billy tonight. So just wait a couple of minutes while he... Um... While I find out how to switch my video on, yeah, Jason. I can hear you, mate, I've totally lost the ability to switch on my video. So let's see if I can work it out now. It's here somewhere, isn't it? it it's in the bottom left-hand corner. Yeah, everyone no. says that. Yeah. It's not in the bottom of my left-hand Oh, I see what I've done. I've moved the screen down. Foolish me. Uh, excellent. The, the joys of Zoom. <laughs> While Billy's waiting to join us, um, just to give a, an indication of how this evening's going to proceed. So, um, there's there's some various um, elements that I want to engage with conversation with Billy to ask a few questions, and um, particularly around kind of his interest in William Blake, and um, particularly his interest in William Blake, but also then the fact that this kind of fits in very much with Billy's view of Englishness, and as Camilla indicated in the introduction, I kind of have a very strong interest in Blake and Englishness as well. Uh, we also then kind of um, want to talk about some of the more esoteric elements of Blake, his kind of his ecstatic visionary qualities. Um, so, so the plan is that um, he and I will be in conversation for about 40 minutes. And this really is an opportunity to hear, Billy, for you to talk about your own experience of Blake. Um, we were talking very much that kind of uh, the professional expertise and actually my 20 years now I've been writing on Blake, how he appears in popular culture, and I've got very little interest in, in the, the I'm, professional I'm, I'm, attitude. I'm aware people watching, you know, watching him may, may know more about Blake than I do, but he's, he's, I'll tell you what's also in the bottom right hand corner, Jason, is Leave Meeting, which I inadvertently clicked on <laughs> in my panic just now. So sorry I disappeared, but I'm back and I'm staying. I'm glad you're back. Blake's one of those people who's in the background of my work. The other person is Kipling and Orwell. And these three figures are kind of, you know, very much people who wrote about um, ideas of uh, identity and belonging in different ways. Obviously, um, Kipling is famous for writing about the empire, but he actually wrote a lot about identity, whether it was um, Indian identity, English identity. Obviously, Orwell, we're all familiar with. He wrote arguably, I would argue, the best book about Englishness ever, which is The Lion and the Unicorn. Um, in which he, in 1941, tries to reconcile supporting Churchill after all that he's been through. That's an amazing book. And then Blake in a much more abstract way, um, obviously initially through Jerusalem, but then through, to me, a, 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 an evocation of a, 
a, a kind of, I don't want to use the word myst mystic, but a more an intangible Englishness yeah. that is open to everybody that's to do with space rather than race. And so he's quite, he's kind of really important to me in that way. I mean, you, you mentioned when we were talking previously that, you know, sort of that, that there's been figures such as Joel Wobble, you know, other artists who are really obsessed, Blake obsesses yeah. in many respects. How did he enter into your own life? How, how did you first, where, where did you first encounter Blake? Tiger, Tiger. Yeah. yeah. Which my is dad, what um, Orwell says is, uh, famously Orwell says that's where he first encountered Tiger, Blake. Tiger, Tiger. So, my dad used to do a parody of it as a poem about the, uh, uh, about a tiger, he's uh, uh, Dicky Dirt, his shirt in the in. in oh, it, was, it was an obscure <laughs> poem, but later years I, I came to realise where it came from, and and also it kind of has uh, for me as one of the great um, as a songwriter, yeah. you know, um, that the the couplet um, and when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make the the weight of that just that couplet on yeah. its own? Is so, uh, you know, Bob Dylan would give his right arm, as would Will, to come up with something that, that asks such a question as that in such a poetic. I mean, you know, when the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears. I mean, it's just, you know, it's right up there for me. It's right up there with the later stanzas of Mr. Tambourine Man, you know, which is my yeah. idea of great poetry. But then that question, you know, that huge spirit, spirit the question he's asking, you know, how can a loving God? tolerate such savagery that question is even being asked tonight in ukraine yes. you know that's how relevant blake is it's not just a poem about you know a, ti a cat a tiger you know yes. it goes much much deeper than that and i think that's the thing for me he it works on so many levels um his his contribution i'm more familiar with his poems rather than with his long uh, format uh, engraved books um and then obviously through Jerusalem, here in Jerusalem, growing up and, you know, uh, being familiar with Parry's uh, version of it and kind of <clears throat> sometime in the in the um, end of the 1980s, uh, realizing that we on the left need to make some kind of argument about the kind of country we want to live in um, rather than turning our back completely on any notion whatsoever of nationalism, which only allowed people like the British National Party to set the debate themselves and decide who does and doesn't belong. I don't think we can afford to do that. So I started looking for ways to um, come to terms with um, that English identity and, and find some reference points for it, because it's kind of, um, it's kind of hard to find those things you know there's a fabulous museum of scotland if you go to edinburgh there's a lovely museum of wales in cardiff there's no museum of england if you want to find england you've got to go into the british museum and we're in between the uh, the romans and the the um byzantians you know we're kind of you've got to prize it out there if anyone comes to our country and tries to find something that resonates with them if you go to scotland and you can find something in the history of scotland that may well resonate with your experience wherever you've come from. But to try and find that narrative in England is really hard to find. There are few and fast things between it. And it brings us back to the national anthem issue as well, which Jerusalem yes. often gets mentioned in, you know, the fact that we have no national anthem, that the Scots sing Fray of Scotland, the Welsh, when we go and play rugby, they sing, well, uh, in fact, Van Haddai, the Welsh national anthem. And what do we sing? God save the queen. You know, and we have such a great song like Jerusalem that, that, you know, evokes the idea of a better society. You know, Flower of Scotland is a great song, but it really suggests that all the Scots are really interested in beating the English. <laughs> you know, it's a, I love it as a song. It's a great, great song. But Jerusalem, Jerusalem challenges us all. I mean, I think, you know, what little I know about Blake, I don't think he was talking about the place, Jerusalem. He was talking about society. He was talking about, you know, what the Americans refer to as the shining city on a hill, a, a, an idea of a better society. And to me, he's, you know, in, in, in the first verse, he's, he's, he's asking a rhetorical question. You know, did Jesus ever come to England? Yeah. Question mark, you know. <clears throat> he left, he should have put the question marks on Jerusalem. People would understand it so much better if we'd have put the question mark on each line, end of each line, the first verse would have really helped. Because <clears throat> he's not 
saying Jesus was an Englishman, far from it. He's, I think to me, he's saying, if Jesus come back tomorrow and saw what we're doing now in the, in the late um, 18th century and saw the Industrial Revolution, would he, you know, what would he say? You know, I think the dark satanic mills to me is the, I, I have images of the, uh, the beam engine, which was developed or, or became widely used during Blake's lifetime. You know, the furnaces that kept the beam engines going, that drove the, the spindles in, in, the, in the huge factories where they were, you know, making um, cotton, uh, processing cotton and stuff like that. The noise in there, the, the heat, those are the things I think of, like, you know, maybe referencing. And then in the, in the second verse, you know, it's, it's so, uh, to me, the, 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 the key aspect of the second verse, it's all me. Give me this, give me that, give me this over here. I'll take one of those, give me that. But the punchline is, till we have built Jerusalem. It's not me, I ain't going to do it. I've got all this gear on. I'm ready, I'm ready for the mental fight. I'm, I'm you know, I'm all here. But it's going to have to be a collective effort. It's going to have to be all of us. And I think that as a national anthem, is so aspirational. It says whatever England is at the moment, we could get it better. We could do better. Yeah. We could push it more, you know? We could create a better I think, society. I think that's one of the big differences between the comments you've just made and very often when, when there's, you know, sort of last night the problems flag-waving type approaches, which is we're great and we don't have to change. And actually what Jerusalem, it, it's, it's looking to that shining city on the hill, as you say, it it's is. looking to the future. And I mean, um, I think, you know, it, it's also as, you know, in terms of a national anthem of all those kind of last night at the prom songs, it's actually the only one that mentions the name of my country. And I think probably that's the, the, the very least you'd expect from your national anthem, isn't it? It's you also, um, you remember the terrible events of 9-11 and when last night the proms was on shortly after that, they took out land of hope and glory and Royal yeah. Britannia, but they left Jerusalem in. Yep. Because, because they're, you know, yeah, they're belligerent songs. Those, yeah. you know, the red, white, and blue songs are belligerent yes. songs where, where Jerusalem is evoking something else, something, you know, and even if you want to be a pedant and say it's about a place in the Middle East, well, it's a place where the world's great religions come together. Yes. It's not a place that belongs to one sort of people. It's a place where many people come together well, and, and you know, in a spiritual space. So I think even that's, a, you know, that's a plus for it. One, one of the things I look at in the book that I'm writing on Jerusalem, Jerusalem as a as an English mythical place has been it's been since at least the 12th 13th century yep. you know you, yep. you go to Hereford the map of Monday has Jerusalem yep. at the of course. Center. center of the uh, universe so, yeah so so you know all English society was yeah. based around Jerusalem for a very long time yeah and it's a very strange song the way people react to it when you sing it because every yes. now and then I'm, I'm in a because I get you know I'd, I'd get asked quite a bit about a national identity, particularly Englishness, because it's a touchy subject. And I think people think, well, Braggy's a lefty. If he can talk about it, we must be all right. We're not going to, we're not going to scare the horses if we get Braggy down. So, I, you know, I've, I've spoken um, one year at WOMAD. I was there with a, with a collective called The Imagined Village. And a WOMAD, the world of music, art and dance, they don't normally have England. England isn't represented. And they kind of grudgingly sort of let us in. And so they, they had a forum about Englishness, which was brill. And we, we, I kind of made my pitch for it. And at the end, everyone was kind of like feeling, oh, okay about this. So I made them all stand up and sing Jerusalem because most people know the words. And it had a really strange effect. Some people walked away. Some people stayed sat down. And some people had a, an ecstatic moment as yes. if it was something that had been released. Yes. And it kind of has that ability to, to evoke something about belonging that isn't um you know uh nationalistic although it talks about our country uh, it doesn't well, actually say you know it's the greatest country in the world and we're going to beat everybody and uh how great we are if you ever want a snippet to to get people to feel good about it um clement Attlee was citing it clement Attlee was quoting it in 1923 in a book called the social worker so it begins right. the, the second page you know till we have built jerusalem in england's green pleasant yeah. land and actually well, liked Blake so much that when um, there was a Time Life journalist in the 40s, when he was prime minister, she, to get an interview, she carried a copy of Blake's poetry because she knew that as soon as he saw that, he'd yeah. give her an interview. Who right, I would. Yeah. But the question is, you've got to ask yourself then, as a Blakeian, how much do we owe uh, Hubert Parry? 
<laughs> Actually, a question that I wanted to ask you, it, and it's particularly that 1990 recording, that version, um, which is really stripped back, you know, your voice, a piano. Um, I, I think when I first heard that, I, I'd, I'd been used to, you know, the full on, you know, Elgar arrangements, full yeah. symphony orchestra. And to hear that, why did you do it that way? I, I, I could guess the answer, but here's my chance to ask you. Why did you do that? Because symphony? it was a personal statement, uh, yeah. because um, other people in my business who had recorded it messed around with it. Yeah. Which is fine. That's fine. I mean, the full recorded version, it's yeah. fine because you're messing with an idea and that's totally, utterly allowed. But I wanted to try and get back to, to, to its absolute essence. I mean, it's the classic, it's the classic arrangement. Yeah. You know, it's the last night of the proms arrangement, but sung solo just with that sparse piano. It happened, we were on tour in America and we were in um, Northampton, Massachusetts, playing that Amherst Women's College there. And they had a huge organ at the back of the stage, which unfortunately they plugged in my keyboard player, Cara Tyvey, sat down and played, started playing Jerusalem. And I started singing along with, oh, this, we could do this tonight. <laughs> we kind of put it in the set. And it was kind of one of those things that we messed around with in the sound check. And then when I had the opportunity to uh, record the Internationale album of political songs, yeah. I thought this definitely belongs there. Yeah, This definitely belongs there. But here's the catch. It's not Parry. It's not Parry that makes it into a great song because I found out this really interesting thing. Many years ago, I was in East Germany. Uh, um, I was invited there by um, a, a, a Scottish musician named Dick Gocken, who's, who's a, com he's a communist. He's a folk singer. He did the, he did the version of The World Turn Upside Down that most influenced my version yeah. rather than Russellson's original version. And while we were there, he, um, uh, he, I wanted to meet the Russian musicians, but to talk to the Russian musicians, you had to have a friendship meeting, which was very formal. And once you've had that, you could kind of have a beer with them. So I went through this palaver and in the friendship meeting, you had to sing a song that expressed your country. And I said to Gokhan, they didn't tell me this before, I said to Gokhan, the only song I know that does that dick is Jerusalem. <laughs> he said, well, sing it, sing Jerusalem. So you sure? He said, yeah. So, so I sang Jerusalem. And he had the salutary effect and everyone was cool. Anyway, a couple of years ago, Dick um, sadly had a stroke and we did a benefit for him. And I wanted to tell this story, but then I, I'm, in, I'm in Edinburgh and I'm going to sing Jerusalem. So there's a slight quandary there. And then I read somewhere that you can sing it to the tune of Ye Branks and, Bays, uh, Branks and, Bra Banks and Braves by Robbie Burns. And I thought, that is amazing. So if you sing it to that tune, it still has the heft. Let me show you. Check this out. I don't know if you know any Robbie Burns. Yeah. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's place? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here amongst these dark satanic mills? It works just as well, doesn't it? Fantastic. Um, if ever you come across it, my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire, bring me my sword, clouds unfold, bring me my chariots of fire. I shall not cease from men to fight. Shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land? So we can't you can't only sing half of it. Once you once you've sung the first, mate, you've got you've got gold. Fantastic. Yeah. So that that kind of. The funny thing was, initially, 
people was kind of like sniggering a bit in Scotland. I don't think they sussed out what I was trying yeah. to do, yeah. you know. But after they realised I was serious, and I was because I mean the interesting thing is um, Blake was a contemporary of Burns, so you know they they could have met at Glastonbury Festival. <laughs> You know, done a gig or, together or one of those gigs that tom payne used to go to with <laughs> yeah absolutely you know, they're all around in that time and so <clears throat> my point is that you know you can still those lyrics still have that emotional power yes even to a, a, a relatively simple three chord melody like banks and braids it's yes. not about the way parry dressed it up although obviously he did an incredible job I, was just, I don't know if you've ever come across Bob Davenport's version. Mm, so yeah. if you have the Common Stone, just a brilliant sort of Northumbrian folk yeah. singing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah, And it should yes. be able to do that. A lyric should be able to do this. It's like working with the Woody Guthrie archive with yeah. Mermaid Avenue, taking his songs. You know, there's songs on there like Way Over Yonder in the Minor Key. I've played them four different ways. I've played it like a folk song, yeah. a rockabilly song, a, yeah. you know, a reggae song, a, a, a great lyric will stand four square, whatever you do it. And it will still, it will still hold that power because... That lyric tells you where to put the builds in, you know. That that lyric is like a gave Hubert Parry a map to yes. say this is where you go up here. This is, you know, it's not like a blank sheet where he's thinking, oh, how do I do this? It's all there in the vision of, of Blake saying how whatever tune you're playing, how it must go, whether it's Bob or or Burns or or Parry or me. Uh, Camilla's just offered that Burns, Blake, and Claire are the forefathers of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. So that would be great. Well, I'd, I'd yeah. certainly pay to see him do a gig together. <laughs> uh, actually, if we if we get following through uh, away a little bit from Jerusalem, the straight nationalism, but but still keeping to sort of questions of English identity. When we we're talking previously, we talked about kind of those ecstatic visions of Blake, or you know, Blake as as part of that dissenting non-conformist tradition, but also one, you know, the, the guy who saw angels in the trees and um, dressed as Adam and Eve with his wife, uh, you know, yeah. in Lambeth. And kind of what, what's the appeal of that aspect of Blake and particularly then how he plugs into that kind of 17th century counterculture well, that emerged in England? I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a theory um, that um, the period of the, of during the, the um, English revolution, so the civil war, the Commonwealth, the Republic, uh, before um, the Glorious Revolution in 1688, there was an unleashing of an Englishness that was totally as weird and as mad as anything seen in any other society. And the antithesis of the straight-laced Britishness that we come, you know, the stiff upper lip and all that stuff. And an, a, an ability to um, connect with, uh, uh, obviously in those days in a spiritual way, politics with what was going on in the Bible. So, you know, um, groups like the Diggers were, were you know, making a, a kind of, you know, a common, a communistic kind of ideal. Then there were the ecstatic uh, sects, so the Ranters, the, uh, the Quakers, the Shakers, all these people who connected with the divine through their own spirituality rather than through a, uh, an organised, a uh, heavily organised, heavily policed religion. And that aspect of Englishness, I think, is is something that is um, held back by the formation of Great Britain. So the the restoration of uh, Charles II, but then the um, Glorious Revolution of 1688, which formalises the the Constitution uh, with the Bill of Rights between the the English Parliament and the Crown. And that's a really crucial moment because it, it's a it's very very important that that. The, uh, the resolution of the issue of how do you hold absolute power to account, which is what the civil war was about, is resolved in a positive way. And we, we move on to parliamentary democracy, although not fully until in my father's lifetime in, in the 1920s, but that we begin down that road. But at the same time, the establishment of a, a Union Jack identity, a monarchy identity, a, um, a kind of... Uh, imperial identity really that, that breaks away from that earthy um kind of uncontrollable uh, uh ecstatic idea of uh how the world is because i think that the the people in in the um you know during the civil war they weren't really they weren't fighting for a republic they were fighting for accountability they were fighting and they didn't just want the crown to be accountable i think they wanted the church to be accountable as well and you see that carry on through the, the dissenters, <clears throat> broadly speaking. 
And for me, when I see uh, Blake's illustrations, and particularly in the kind of complex way he tries to describe what's happening in the world, because he's obviously plugged into what's going on. He's obviously, you know, clearly he's, you know, aware of what's happening in the world. He's writing about the French Revolution, about the American Revolution. You know, he's not away with the fairies in, in, the, in the kind of, you know, hippy-dippy kind of way. He seems to be plugged in with what's going on. But his attempts to make sense of that and to articulate that in a kind of a visionary ecstatic way, I, I, I feel he's the kind of last flowering of that moment where the English were finally able to speak for themselves, to be them their true selves and, and show that kind of like a glorious kind of, uh, uh, vision of a, of a better society and, and you know it's kind of shade in a way that Thomas Paine is coming in with reason and he's trying to explain the world through again through accountability I and mean, that's what the rights of man is really about but, the, but you know the people in the, the 17th century the, the levelers, the diggers, the ranters they didn't have that concept of human rights, they didn't have that concept of individual, the rights of, in the individual they only had the bible so they could only talk in those terms. And Blake's kind of, I think he's doing the same thing, although he's, he's creating his own uh, uh, Bible, if you like, with his own characters, his own stories. And they work, you know, and they're not necessarily as straight as, you know, the way he uses the, the name Albion and different levels to mean different things. You know, sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes he is talking about Britain or he might be talking about England or he might be talking about a giant or he might be talking about himself. You know, you got you kind of. He's trying to make sense of a of a time of incredible change, incredible. You know, there's there's a kind of uh, watershed moment on the Industrial Revolution, where I think so much of um, British culture, and you see it even still today with the obsession of Emily Bronte, and uh, you know uh, the Pickwick Papers, and that sort of stuff, where. There was a golden age, and if you look closely at what that golden age is, before they invented the train, when people lived and went around on horses. I mean, that's what Pickwick Papers is all about. It's about a bunch of people going around looking at England as it was. Already people are nostalgic by the time <clears throat> Dickens is writing Pickwick Papers. And that has not left us. That, you know, pastoral vision of the calm countryside and, you know, the, the, you know, the poor man at the gate and the squire and his castle and all that... Blake just clears that table. He swipes that table away and says, no, there's another world. There's another world here that's, you know, going on in front of us and you're not seeing it. You're really not seeing it. So I think that, you know, unfortunately that, that becomes much more formalized in the, in the latter part of the 19th century, you know, the pre-Raphaelites and the romantics and, you know, commerce comes sliding in and, uh, and spoils it. Although having said that, we all know Blake would have loved it if he could have sold loads of books and loads of paintings. I can't really, you know, he would like to have been Elvis as well. Yeah, yeah, he 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 did want to he did want to be known. Yeah, right, so you're, too. Right, yeah, so you, too. You know, you He wasn't just doing it for fun. No, no, no. He he, he had to make a living. And mm. um, your comments about Thomas Paine that there's a great quote, or, or I'll paraphrase it by E.P. Thompson. He says. For Blake, the, the problem with pain was that pain saw the problems of the moral law. He saw, you know, oppression and strictures and laws, but he hadn't got a vision of the everlasting gospel. He yeah. kind of he was missing that inner light, yep. you know, that spark. Well, there's a break, isn't there? There's yeah. a break. That's the what we call the enlightenment, you know, the yeah. move away from that. But then you get someone like Newton, who uh, you know, was equally a part of the Enlightenment, but also on the quiet a bit of a mystic. You know, he was yes. reading his tea leaves and stuff like that, you know. He was kind of going around, you know, he had a bit of that, that to him as well. I don't think it was either or back then. And nor was it either or for Blake, because he's also involved in the, in the process of, you know, the creative process is pretty industrialised. You know, he's, yeah. you know, he's a metal basher or a scraper anyway, you know, and, and he's not afraid to do that. He's not, again, as I mentioned before, he's not putting himself aloof from society. He's right in there trying to, you know, make sense of, of what it is and talk to people and connect with people. Yeah. And uh, I think he could have been just a little bit more straightforward, you know. Maybe if he'd have been around in our time, you know, he could have made a record called something like, Oi, don't piss in my garden. <laughs> that would have, I think that if he could have done something like that, it would have 
you know, people would have took more notice. It's a bit punky on now, but Joe Wobble was sus. He, he would understand. Absolutely. And, and I think we talked before that that's going to be the title of your next album. For... <laughs> could be, yeah. You heard it, it could, here first. That Blake, that Blake, that for, for the Blakeians in, um, in, my, in my audience said, no, exactly of what I talk, of what I speak. So um, that kind of that ecstatic, dissenting, visionary Blake, I mean, one one that there's a get out of jail card that I often use. If you don't want to talk about Blake as a mystic because of all the the associations, you know, Blake as a visionary, Blake who literally uses art to see, is really important. And, and again, and um, and with Camilla having introduced us because she knows this more than anybody. Um, I don't, don't know if Kerry's here tonight because he's another really important person on this. Blake as an inspiration for musicians is hundred percent, hundred percent huge, and not just in the way that you you think. Yeah. I can't tell you how much comfort I've taken from, uh, you know, knock on, knock on, Voltaire Rousseau, knock on, knock on, it's all in vain. You throw that shit into the wind and the wind just blows it back again. You know, yeah. uh, many a time I've looked at my reviews and thought of that. So <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not just the, the, the great songwriting, which I already, you know, alluded to in terms of uh, the tiger. But yeah, so, so, I mean, he just crops up again and again. Yeah. And just, and, and also, I mean, just because his words are so simple to set to music, you know, because yeah. they are so metrical and so rhythmic. Of course, yeah. But um, he also has that kind of, uh, he kind of he kind of has that indie vibe yeah. as well. You know what I mean? He's not just doing it um, to make a living. He'd like to make a living, but something is compelling him, you know, and it's not, the, it's not, uh, it's not um, to satisfy his consumers. He's not, trying to fit into something in that sense he's you know he's not compromising yes he's not and he doesn't understand why people don't get it that's the, that's the great tragedy yeah in billy blake he doesn't understand why these things he's seeing why people don't get it and the reason they don't get it he's 100 years ahead of his time you know and in 17 1790s, the first independent label in Lambeth. So, you know, That's he's right. got that going for him as well. That's right. Yeah, Black Mills Records, Dark Satanic Mills Records. Oh, Camilla just um, dropped in. Um, would you like to tell us a bit about the head of Blake in the background? Oh, yeah. How it Blake came into your possession. Yeah. yeah, it came into my possession. I did a, a thing um, that was connected to the Blake um, exhibition at the Tate around the turn of the century. Um, and there was an exhibition there and we, we did a, an event, I think it was at the Purcell Rooms in London, uh, and it was myself and Jar Wobble, aforementioned, uh, Alan Moore was on it, uh, Ewan McGregor was on it, and beforehand I went down to the, uh, to the Tate just to get me eye in again, so I didn't come out and make a complete fool of myself, and, I, and they, they let me in for free because I was doing the gig, and I saw these busts, you know, the, the life mask bust in the shop. And I said, oh, you know what, actually, I need one of those so I can uh, talk to him tonight. And uh, if you look in the reviews, I am talking to him. But um, they should never have given it to me because I didn't give it back to him. <laughs> I took it home. But that's not the end of it because what happened was I was dusted in my room and it fell off the top of my cabinet. Look, it, it come off the top of the cabinet and, sh and shattered on the floor. And so I had to remount it like that. Look, and that incredible. But now my partner, who never before really even noticed it, now it terrifies her. <laughs> I, have to, I have to see, see I don't know why Absolutely. it's changed much. But yeah, it cracked, the, it slid off and fell on its back. And then I looked down and I thought, oh my God, that's that. I could just have to get that remounted. So my fortune, my brother in law is a bit of a, a, bit of a maker. And he said, give it me and I'll, I'll find out something to put it on. So, yeah, he did a, he did a great job Fantastic. on it, didn't he? That's yeah. become a, a, a completely unique item there. Yeah, it is, yeah. That's what, I, that's what I love about it. I try not to dust it too much now, just in case. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're going to go into some questions for, um, for the audience in a moment. But I just want to end, you, you mentioned at the beginning, sort of like, a, you know, that, that feeling of kind of, pride in making your country, making your place better, but what they're fighting in Ukraine at the moment. And I wanted to return for a few minutes to um, the book that you brought out earlier on the progressive patriots and, and rereading that again. So I quote it quite a bit in the um, Jerusalem book is I, I'd forgotten just how pointed it was about the rise of the BNP, you know, mm. in the early 2000s. And that a lot of those chapters, you're responding to that. And you're obviously, Blake gets a couple of mentions, but it's more, I mean, Orwell's more important, you know, yeah. mentioned more often. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, some of the comments you've made tonight is sort of like, you know, the lack of a national anthem for England. 
the fact that we're, I think one chapter was it, um, born under two flags, you know, that, yeah. that kind of element. I, ju I just wonder if you want to say a little bit to, to return and kind of wrap up there about what's, why you return to those feelings of Englishness and what you're trying to do there and why it's important. Well, I wrote the book because the British National Party won 12 council seats in my hometown, Barking and Dagenham in East London. Every seat they stood, if they'd have stood a full, uh, a full slate, they'd have won the council. Yeah. And so there would have been a, a, a fascist council in one of the most multicultural boroughs in London. It was absolutely shocking. And then my hometown, all of a sudden, is the, is the you know, racist capital of Britain, which is just yeah. bullshit. It's no more racist or less racist than your hometown. It's just had these arseholes knocking on people's doors, winding up neighbour against neighbour. So how do you respond to that? Well, I'd already made an album called England Half English. I'd already, you know, put, I had to do something more. So what I what I felt I should do is write a book that explains why I love my country, what it is that, about my country that I love. And that's what I tried to, to do. And I took, as, as you mentioned, my uh, kind of reference point was Orwell and the Lion and the Unicorn. And that kind of helped to guide me through. But I did very quickly come across the whole idea of, uh, of national anthems and, and that, lack, that lack thereof. You know, why, why are the, the English football team or the, anybody else so afraid of having a song other than God Save the Queen? I don't think, you know, the monarchy hasn't crumbled because the Scots don't sing it anymore. It doesn't kind of... And Jerusalem offers us an a anthem based on values. And progressive patriotism is different from... Um, the traditional idea of patriotism in, in that it is not about uh, symbols. It's not about institutions. It's not about things that are immutable. I think patriotism, traditional patriotism is, is about things that don't change and you have to, a status quo that you have to uh, subscribe to if you're going to be in that country. And if you don't subscribe to that, then you, you know, you're going you're gonna to get called a traitor. Well, progressive patriotism is based around the values that a country aspires to. And in our case, there, there, there are five values that the government says we aspire to, and they're tolerance, uh, you know, diversity. And the most important of them, the last one, is the, is the rule of law. And obviously, you know, when you've got a prime minister standing up and lying bare face to parliament, and you can understand why a patriot like myself, whose patriotism is based on the values of his society and the reality of it, that the the, the, you know, why we, why we would get so angry, why we would get so angry, because Orwell says a great thing that really, for me, sums up the whole idea of national identity. And he says, he's writing in, uh, in, in 1940, and he says, what does England of 1940 have in common with England of 1840? And he asks a rhetorical question, he says, well, what do you have in common with that four-year-old child on your parents' mantelpiece. Nothing except that you're the same person. And that to me says something about how countries change yet remain the same, <clears throat> ultimately, you know? And that, that paradox, that strange paradox, um, we have to kind of work out a way to deal with. And Blake plays into that. You know, Blake is as, um, a part of that alternative idea of, a, of an England based on, on values, you know, till we have built Jerusalem. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I shall not cease from mental fight. That's how, you know, that's the progressive patriots national anthem really for us, because it's all talking about, you know, we love our country and we want it to be better. And we, you know, and when it doesn't live up to those values, we're not, they're not our values. They don't belong to us. They, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, broad values, but we believe that, you know, the, we should be striving to embody them. And, and, and Blake gives us a way to manifest, gives us a song to sing with all those flag waving people who want to sing Land of Open Glory. So we don't have to sit on our hands and, you know, feel grumpy. We've got Jerusalem to stand up and make us feel that we should aspire to these values. And as I say, the way things have gone over the last couple of years, um, as we've seemed to have moved further away from accountability, then I think Blake still has, and Jerusalem particularly, still has a, a role to play in that. Thank you. I think that's a perfect note to end our conversation. And what I'd like to do now is to open up for any questions from other members of the audience. I've got loads if people don't come in. So, cool. Well, you so keep, please, keep coming. I'm, I'll take I, all I, I, <laughs> I, I was actually, uh, while, while people are raising hands, so yeah, um, as Tech Sport just asked, if people can raise the hand function, 
and then we'll be able to um, unmute you to join in. Um, you give a great quote, I mean, you mentioned the line on the unicorn, uh, patriotism has nothing to do with conservatism, it's actually the opposite of conservatism, since it is a devotion to something that is always changing, and yet is felt to be mystically the same. It is the bridge between the future and the past. There's Billy Blake right there, quote. there's your Billy Blake Absolutely. right there, there he, is. there he is, stark bollock yeah. naked, flying up <laughs> like Albion awake, look at him, put your trousers on Bill. <laughs> yeah. Give us a sign. Um, so we've got a couple of coming. So first of all, Simon and then Neil. So Simon. Cool. Simon, so, I think you can un unmute yourself now, mate, or someone can unmute yeah. you. Simon. No, nope, you're muted still, Simon. Can't hear you. I see your lips move, but can't hear you. There we go. <laughs> There That's exactly it, mate. That's it. I'm glad to see there's someone else <laughs> as good as me at this shit. What's up? <laughs> well, at least I was on the, the left side there, not on the right. <laughs> uh, well, I just wanted to ask you, uh, Billy, it seems to me, and uh, thank you very much for, for, your, for your presentation today. It's been spot on, I, th I feel. Thank you. And a joy to listen to. Um, and uh, would you agree with me that Blake's art is really based on raising questions all the time about opening up, leading us into debates. A lot of them we don't really want to go into, like about good and evil and this and that, and taking us deep into, making us think about where we are and about our identity. The tiger you've talked about yeah. in Jerusalem, question, question. I mean, the question. tiger, the tiger's a good example because as I say, it's, you know, it's a, in many ways, it's a, it's a poem that kids recite at school yet it has the that deep deep question about a you know a uh a, you know a good god could how could how could that how could the two things exist at the same time so yeah i do think he does ask this question i mean he's you know he came from a dissenting background his entire work dissents really doesn't it from everything yeah. from everything um but that's the that's the the courage that he has to 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 be that person, to live that life, and to and to 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 pose those questions. So yeah, I, I think, as I say, I think he still has a huge relevance to us. And that vital question: What is the price of experience? Exactly, exactly, hundred percent. Can you buy it in the market? Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Billy. Really no impressive. worries. Nice oh, thank you, Jason. Cheers, Simon. Thank you. You're very welcome, uh, Neil. If I could bring you in next, please. Hi, Billy. Hi, Neil. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, mate. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks so much for tonight. Um, you've, um, in, in you know, previous gigs and stuff, you've mentioned about the uh, English flag being usurped um, by the far right. I mean, is it possible to kind of take that back again? It's worth trying. It may not be possible. It may not be possible. But, um, I mean, I, I think that the thing about Englishness is, well, first of all, it's intangible. It's an abstract idea. And just because you're born in England and speak English doesn't mean that you have to therefore be English. You know, identity is very, very personal. But because of history and because of the fact that Britishness covers Englishness completely, um, you know, it, it's, it is possible to treat Englishness as a, a new space. Uh, you know, for instance, um, the Scots, since they got their own national anthem, that's the first time I realised something else was going on. I'm sorry to keep coming back to national anthems, but the first time I realised something was going on up there was when they sang Frau Scotland, which is a song I know because I was into the Corries. It was written by one of the Corries. Um, at the rugby, I was watching on the telly. I thought, wow, what's going on? And it's the first cognizance I had of Scots nationalism. And, you know, they, they have managed to forge a kind of post-imperial identity for Scotland as if almost that they never had nothing to do with the British Empire, whereas we all know they were as much involved in it as the, as the rest of us. And if we're not careful, England's going to be left holding the imperial baby at the end of this. The Irish, the Welsh, the Scots will all be like, nothing to do with me. It was those people over there, those nasty English people. But we need to try and find a way to <clears throat> reconcile those issues and face those issues um, in a way that allows us then to say, there's a, there's a, a change here. That was an imperial culture, a red, white, and blue culture, a Union Jack culture. But this is this is England. I mean, I hate to say 
these two words together, but this is a kind of a new England here that we're getting to. Maybe we need a new flag, you know. Maybe we need a, a green flag with the white horse of Uppington on it or something. I don't know. But, but at the same time, you know, people feel strongly about those kind of flags. So I don't mind what the flag is. What I mind about is that my neighbours feel intimidated by it when they see it on the back of a white van. No one feels that about the Scottish flag or the Welsh flag or the Irish flag. And that's all our responsibility is to do something about that. And if Blake's Jerusalem allows us a way to gather around an idea and to propagate that idea of an aspirational sense of Englishness, then it's worth, you know, bringing him in. You know, it might, it, you know, some people don't like it because it's a hymn and they don't like the religious aspect of it. I'm forever having to explain to people it's actually much, much wackier than that, mate. But I think, you know, it is worth reclaiming the, the English space, the space that is England that encompasses us all, that we, as we stand in this space and everything within it is part of whatever Englishness is. And that includes Billy Blake, that includes Stonehenge, that includes people who just arrived here yesterday on a boat coming across the channel. It's all those things and more. Thank you. Uh, just to say, you know, you've been a huge um, <clears throat> influence on me over the years um, and um, brought a lot of uh, your stuff into my consciousness, including this and Blake. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. And one final thing, Billy, um, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a good friend of Liam and Caroline. Uh, oh, right. yeah. And um, I wondered if I could send you a, I'm a musician as well, yeah. a little version of a, a song I did called Milkman of Human Kindness. Of course you can. I'll send it through Liam and Caroline. Thank you so much. That'd be great. Nice to talk to you. Thank you, man. You too, man. Cheers. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Roger, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Billy, um, the discussion has been fascinating tonight. Uh, I can relate to everything you're saying, so thank, thank you, you very much for that. My pleasure. Just a question. Um, have you ever attempted to set one of Blake's poems to music? Or I haven't, if not, actually. Do you think after tonight you may be um, inspired to after, yeah. after meeting this? It kind of is something that... Uh, that that I, you know, I've, I've often thought of sort of reading the poems, but people have done such good work on that and that before, you know, but I've kind of, you know, messing around with Jerusalem and finding different tunes for Jerusalem, I've found that's been quite interesting. And I think it's, it's it, it, by focusing what I'm doing on uh, live on, on Jerusalem, it does allow me to put that English idea across, which I'm always trying to, to cause, cause I said, I, I, I did it at, um, not always people don't always walk away i did it at a um book festival in the west country which was a, a discussion about the lion and unicorn with a panel and at the end of that everyone felt so positive about being english that i stood up and made them all sing jerusalem there and it all got a bit religious they all got a bit weepy the people on the panel even got a bit weeping it's just kind of that the wonder of that song has the ability to kind of touch people in a way i had to shout the lines out beforehand so they knew the lines it was a bit like a bingo call but there's nothing wrong with that you know but my, the thing I worry most about is that half a dozen lines I write on the back of a fag packet inadvertently become the national anthem. Because, I mean, if Blake knew, after all that shit he's done, the thing we end up obsessing over is something he knocked off in half an hour when he was a bit pissed, which is what Paul Weller did with That's Entertainment, and that's why he doesn't like it. I think he'd be appalled. He'd be like, for Christ's sake, look at all these pictures. Look, look, I, this was as big as an house I did this picture. <laughs> Well, Blake actually threw and did those feet away after two yeah. copies. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't his favourite poem at all. No, no. That's the, right, that's the great thing. You do wonder about that in the back of your mind. And it's like, oh, OK, that bloke. Oh, he's the bloke <laughs> who wrote uh, whatever it was that you, you know, whatever it is you just knocked off. Strange times. Thanks, Roger. Um, Stephen. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Oh, really? That was um, That was fantastic. Thank you so Thank much you. for that. I just wanted to um, just share something on uh, some of my favourite lines, just four of them, with Jerusalem in it, and mm. sort of expresses how England sort of reaches out to other nations and other nations, um, you know, the sort of interpenetration of nations across the world, really. Um, and Blake takes the idea of, of the uh, money exchanges in London and counters that idea of, of that sort of imperial power and the money funding things all over the empire with um, in my exchanges, every land shall walk and mine in every land. Mutual shall build Jerusalem, both heart in heart and hand in hand. 
and those lines always move me deeply because mm. uh, it's, it's a, so it, interesting. It's, it just plays more into that idea that he's talking about a collective society, that he's talking about a group of people working together to make a better society in a, in a, in a way. And, you know, with the idea of Jerusalem being the, the centre of things, the font of things, the, the ideal of things, you know, I think that's a very powerful way to try and put those kind of ideas across. It is, yeah, very yeah. much about the, the collective, isn't it, yeah. as opposed it to... Is the yeah. strong man shall we yeah say. exactly <laughs> conscious. although he does have a bit of that in his writing doesn't he he does well he, he certainly does. has a strong will doesn't he he Our does will. yeah thanks very much my really pleasure fantastic. thank you i so, said um i'm going to read out a couple of the comments as well cool. so somebody, there are a few people talking about kind of you know blake as an anti-colonial writer um alongside people such as burns and yep. shelley if, uh, and, and um, I just want to share a comment from Brian. For the Scots and the Welsh, it's about the country, the place. It should be for the English also. Then it doesn't matter about background. The spiritual connection is with the place. And actually, that was one thing when writing the book about Jerusalem. Um, it's, for me, going to Felpham and seeing the Sussex Downs, you know, that part of the country. Blake grew up around London, lived nearly, all, apart from three years, lived all of his yeah. life in London. But it's when he goes to the south coast and sort of sees the English countryside, that's when he actually has this kind of epiphany about yeah. Albion. And, mm. and, you know, oh, my God, this is actually where it is. Yeah. Most of his stuff from the 1780s and 90s is actually quite anti-English. And yeah. then after he goes to Felpham, that's kind of when he rediscovers it. I think that's the way he's, I mean, he's getting older. You know, yeah. he's, re he's reflecting a bit more. But with regard to Scots and the Welsh, our, our, our neighbours have the benefit of a border between them and the Westminster Parliament. <laughs> We don't have that. So it's harder for us to see where Englishness begins and Britishness ends. You know, for, for the Scots and the Welsh, there's Office Dyke, you know, there's the Tweed. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have, we don't even have a psychic Office Dyke, a psychic Tweed, where we can see, you know, that, the, that you know, those people in the House of Commons who are British and those people in the House of Commons who are English. We can't, we can't suss that out, even, even with accent. Uh, because, uh, because um, you know, we're multitudes of accents, like all countries, we're multitudes, you know, and that kind of, that kind of starts plugging Blake into Walt Whitman now, we're getting up that end of things, aren't we now, and then yes. you get past, much further past Walt Whitman, you're right into the back of Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan, and we come around full circle again. Yes. So, uh, but yeah, I, it, it's tougher for England, because we can't see ourselves. There are very few times where you actually see England manifested right the world cup or any you know any sporting event where england are playing look at who we are we're not white we're not male we're all different colors all different people and that's why when when the flags are out for the football or, or the rugby or whatever i'm i'm totally cool with that i'm not like these people are fascist you know flags are all about context ask the germans you know, they didn't use their flag when they had the World Cup in their country last time until their team got to the semi-finals. And they suddenly realised, well, hang on a minute, everyone else got their flag out, we've got a flag, and all, haven't we? <laughs> so they got their flag out. So it's all about context. You know, when you see a, the flag of St George on, a, on the top of a church tower, Norman church tower, you don't think neo-Nazis. You might see it, you know, in the back of a pub somewhere. But then again, you might find out it's, you know, it's the rugby's on or something. You've got to be, you can't have that knee-jerk reaction to it. Um, we've got to, we've got to generate a sense of, uh, first, a sense of belonging so that then we can be at ease with these kind of things. Somebody's just commented the Olympics opening ceremony at Stratford gave us a glimpse of a better England. Um, I also, I mean, this is on my mind a lot at the moment. It, it's a comment you made this evening about kind of, in, if, if we're not careful, England's going to be left with the Imperial baby. Yeah. And if you look at what's going on in Russia, that's the problem. Yeah. It is Russia, a problem. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Nostalgia for empire. Nostalgia for yeah. empire. It gives me nightmares. Yeah. It really gives yeah. me nightmares. And I think, you know, I'm not saying we just say, oh, that wasn't us. It was the, it was the British. What, what we say is that we, yeah, we did all those things. hundred percent. We did all those things, but that's not who we are now. We're not those people anymore, you know, and that we've come to, we have to come to terms with that. We have to be honest about what we did. We have to be honest about the idea that an empire is only based on one idea and that's exploitation, whatever yes. empire it is. You know, why did the Romans come here? It wasn't for the weather, you know? So it's, it's always going to be, it always is, you know, why does Putin want the Donbass? 
You know, yeah. it's like we've got to, we, and we can't do that if we're, if we're protecting statues of slavers. You know, we've got to be able to come to terms with that and build that uh, museum where people of color can come and see the contribution they made to our country and see themselves reflected in that and be there, you know? So that's, and, and Blake has illustrations that can bring that on board as well and help us to tell that story. That there's, there's a line in Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion where it says, you know, I see a new nation, the, the, the Britain, the Roman, the Saxon, the Viking, right, the Norman rise up into one new nation, yeah. the English. It, for him, it was always multicultural. It was, yeah. it was never ethno. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Same with Kipling. I mean, Kipling writes yeah. in, you've probably seen it in the book, you know, talking about the, the Saxon and Norman and, the, and the, the, you know, and the Celt all taking a dip in Barking Creek where I come from, yes. you know. Yes, yes. It's kind of, that's, this has always been, because of the nature of our country being on the edge of, of an entire, such a huge landmass, we've always been a place where people have drifted in and out, you know, that land of mists that Caesar feared so much when he looked across from Calais, you know, that's Blake's England. Yes. Okay, um, there's a couple more comments coming in. Oh, you've really sparked people's thoughts tonight. So thank you very much. I hope so. I hope so. That's, absolute, my, that's my job. Yeah, absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, Tim, if I can invite you um, to come back in now. Uh, with comments about our next event, which will be taking place as well. But um, I can just ask everyone to give thanks for Billy tonight and a new version of Jerusalem played on air. So absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Real pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. Really enjoyed playing it as well. It's, it's, a, it's a while since I've sung that and I was uh, I was thinking to myself, oh, it might be nice just to just, rather than yeah. talk about it, to actually show yeah, how absolutely. it worked, you know. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me, everyone. Really enjoyed it. I hope it's made sense. And um, yeah, I have to uh, just ask Stephen where he got his wallpaper from. <laughs> Everyone, um, on behalf of the Blake Society, I'd like to thank Billy Bragg. As you know, this event was um, to support the restoration of Blake's cottage in Falpham. And when we've renovated the cottage, we will restore the garden. And this was an inspirational talk. And I think of how, instead of having a sign, do not walk on the grass. I think we could be inspired by Billy to have, oik, don't piss in my garden. It's in my garden. <laughs> that would be a great, oh. you could sell the t-shirt. You could have a t-shirt. <laughs> Everyone, our next event, we're moving on from Zoom, we're going live, and it's a theatrical performance, I'll be in awake, and it will be at Swedenborg House in the month of May. So we look forward to seeing all of you there. So thanks to Jason, thanks to Billy, and thank you all for supporting this project. And Good thanks night, also everyone. to Camilla. Thank yes. You. And to thank Camilla. You. Yeah, yes, everybody. Thanks, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've, I tell you, I've really enjoyed reconnecting with Blake because I thought to myself, you know, I've, I've been chatting with Camilla about doing this and I thought if I do this, I'm gonna have to really get my head around, you know, who he is to me and how I love him and how much I do love him. And it's kind of sitting here, you know, when this evening just playing Banks and Braves and singing Jerusalem to that tune again. It was, it's been really lo lovely for me as well. So thank you very, very much for the invitation. And uh, I look forward to coming down to uh, Felpham when it's all together and seeing that lovely view that, uh, that Blake looked at. So thanks again to everybody. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>